Thomas. And hey, we got something a little special that we're doing today. We're going to do something just a tad bit different. Well, I'm kind of the, I guess, the, the guest and the host, along with my producer and partner in crime, John. So, John, today, we're going to have a little fun with this. We're going to do a little recap of the last game. We're going to go into some discussions about other Big Ten teams. And then we got a special Q&A at the end where I put it out on Twitter to have fans ask questions. So that's going to be the fun part of the day. Well, you know what? I take that back. All of it is a fun part. Hey, <laughs> so we always, just going always fun. It's always Thank fun on champagne. Exactly. Big John, what's up, baby? Doing good. How about yourself? Man, I can't complain. You know, we get to sit here, talk Illinois basketball. Illinois did knock down and won five games in a row. And now I'm sitting here questioning how these people bump us out of the top 25, thinking that there are 25 teams in the country that are better than us. I don't know, John. I think these there, folks. There, there's next week. There's next week. There's always next week. You saw Bama. <laughs> Bama just beat Gonzaga, and they were out of top, or you know, they were they fell, and now they're going to come back. Well, I, I know we'll come back, but it was just a shocker to me that the so-called experts think that there are 25 teams better than Illinois, and seeing we lost one game without the most dominant player in college basketball, and then you get that held against you. You know, where no knock on Michigan. I, I love that, you know, Juwan Howard is one of my best friends. But, man, Michigan held on in the top 25 after losing three games. I, I don't know. I think that might be a little bit of biasness there, Lion Eye Nation. I know how far hey, you, you If you're an expert, get on that panel, Dion. Hey, man, all they have to do is let me on. I'm ready. I might be the only one that has played, that has coached, and that is now on the media side if I'm sitting on that panel. They need to let me on there, man. You, you got the resume. <laughs> I think so, too. <laughs> so, big fella, let's move into this last game. I'm sure you had an opportunity of watching the Illinois Rutgers game. And when I was on the radio with my partner in crime, Brian Barnhart, who was also one of our guests on Champagne on Ice, we talked about making a statement, you know, in that first game, making a statement and coming out and, and laying down the law. And especially when you're at home, it's already hard to win in the Big Ten. You know, I, I know you over there at Quinnipiac, and I won't blame that on you, especially seeing you got family at the University of Illinois. I won't hold that against you, John. You're still my man. But you want to come out and lay a statement and, and – do you think they laid a statement, John, or, or is it just me? I mean, I think 86 to 51. Yeah, definitely. 35-point win. I mean, like, any Big Ten win, any any in-conference win like that is going to be something to ride, like, especially with what you said, like, uh, that lost Marquette and, you know, just feeling like the team was a little bit down, but then hitting their stride and right into Big Ten play. Oh, yeah. And, you know, and that, and I, I always often talk about how I love the way they the Big Ten do, does this now and, and the way they've added the extra games. I mean, there's 20 Big Ten games. So every game is important, especially in the Big Ten. But, you know, the way they did it, the way Illinois did it, you know, players are still hurt. Players are sick coming off of sickness. This has been probably the rare the, the maybe the hardest coaching job for Coach Underwood in the definitely for sure in this early part of the season. I mean, he didn't realize or even know who his starting lineup was going to be before this game because you had guys that were sick and injured. And, and you know, so it's kind of like a triage center more so than putting together a five, uh, your first five on the court, man. It was it was pretty ugly out there for a second. Yeah, I mean, when you shoot almost 50% from the field as a team overall, like – you're doing something right. So especially when, you know, you got Plummer getting 24, uh, Kofi getting a, uh, a double-double, you know, Grandison mm -hmm. off the bench. Like every everyone contributing to the team in general without Corbello um, and just showing why you're still one of the better teams in the Big Ten. Uh, well, see, I'm going to say the best team in the Big hey. Ten. I remember what this team did to Purdue last year. So until Purdue proves to me that they're better than Illinois and not just by their record, 
I'm still rolling with we are the best team in the Big Ten. And yes, Illini Nation, I am a bit of a homer, but you know I'm honest and I tell you the truth too. But you said you mentioned something there that I know we expected this young man to be able to come out and you know be a microwave and, and light up some things from the outside. But man, Alfonso Palmer right now is averaging over 20 points a game the last four. His shooting has been so efficient. But there are two things that, you know, watching this young man that we knew, well, that we felt at Illinois might be a little bit of a liability was his defense. Shorty is defending. He is, he, I'm not going to say he's locking people up like Trent Frazier, Line Our Nation, but man, is he defending on the ball? He's defending off the ball. He's been great in help position. Alfonso Plummer, we had him on, uh, not after this game, but the previous game. And we talked to him on the radio and we said, man, what, you know, we knew you could shoot the ball, but what was your thoughts when you came to Illinois? The very first thing that young man said, he was like, I had to learn how to play defense. You don't hear people say that, John. I had to learn how to play defense, so I came to a team where I know I can light it up and play defense. I, I was shocked by his answer, but pleased at the same time. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, when you're that young of a guy wanting to get better, get better at something that you know you struggle with is definitely show, show some form of, like, leadership and, you know, mm -hmm. confidence building go, going into the season. He knows his strengths and he wants to – strengthen his weaknesses so get coming into the year he knew he could shoot but wanting to get better on the defensive end to you know help this team win and help get them back to uh prominence and you know being the best big 10 team um is something that he had to work on and he he's definitely been showing that um early part of the season yeah he has man i mean he's he's been lights out and just his energy when he steps on the court I mean, I think it's infectious. And, and he and Trent Frazier, the way they are, they're like the Energizer Bunnies out there, man. And, and they really have not energized just the guys on the court, but the people in the stands, too. But you know who I have been most impressed with? I mean, I expected the growth for a lot of these guys, but what Coleman Hawkins, I call him the Hulk, what the Hawk has done, man, from his freshman year to his sophomore campaign now, from what he has done offensively when Kofi was out putting up big numbers to understanding and sliding back into his role uh, now that Kofi is back on the court. Man, he was defending one of the best offensive players, not just in the Big Ten, but in the country. I mean, Ron Harper Jr., you know, has been dropping dudes off for the four now five years that he's been in college. He's been dropping dudes off. And Coleman Hawkins, this is Ron Harper Jr.'s stat line, Illini Nation, just in case you didn't hear. Five points, one for nine from the field, one for three from the three, two out of two. Now, Ron Harper, and the reason I say the defense is so good, not just that he only, he held a 20-point score to five. Ron Harper normally shoots about, you know, close to 20 shots a game, 15, 20. He had nine. And I had a coach tell me one time, I said, well, coach, you know, I'm leading the, lead, I'm leading the Big Ten in block shots. And he says, hey, Dion, if you were a better defender, you wouldn't have to block so many shots. Now, the meaning behind that was he was telling me, stop letting my man get the ball. Stop letting him, you know, get into positions where he's comfortable to be able to shoot. That's when you can tell you're a defender. This dude had nine shots. That means he was not comfortable shooting the ball. That means he was not getting the ball when he wanted it and where he wanted it on the floor. And all that was because of, like I said, the Hawk, number 33, Coleman Hawkins. What do you think about the young fella? I know you had a, uh, just a little bit, maybe a few chances to see him play. What do you think about him? Yeah, I mean, like, I've definitely been seeing Ron Harper uh, play in the Big Ten so far. And, like, it, it, it does show something when even, – even when you are – it wasn't good shots, and he wasn't able to get the shots either way. So, 
you know, when you are playing lockdown defense like Coleman Hawkins was uh, that night and has, uh, again, through the early part of the season, you know, you, you need that in the Big Ten. You're not going to, you know, ever, a lot of guys can score in, the, in this conference, but if you can shut it down, that's when you know your team's legit. And only allowing the whole team to 51 is a testament to the team's defense and uh, especially with guys like Coleman and uh, Plummer, like we mentioned. I mean, you mentioned 51 points, man, but 31% from the floor. Now, I, I'm sure Coach will be a little upset about the 41% from three, but they didn't make a lot, nor did they take a lot. And yeah. 50% from the free throw line. And then another thing Illinois did, which they have kind of, they've done this since coaches got in there, is really like dominate the glass. And they dominated the glass again at a, you know, plus 14. So there was 47 to 33 on the glass with 13 offensive rebounds. I mean, what Illinois is doing from a defensive standpoint, and they've held, I think the last, um, I forgot what the number was. We talked about it on the radio, but every team under 40, um, 40% from the floor. You, you have to really be humming and cooking with gas if you're shutting teams down and holding them to 40. I mean, especially high-level teams that, that, that are in this conference but throughout college basketball as a total, man. And I know Coach always hangs his hat on defense. And, and those guys, like you said, man, they're flying around, they're getting tips, they're playing great team defense as well as individual defense. You know, this Illinois team is, is, has been impressive on the on the offensive end. I mean, defensive end. But you talk about my big boy, man, Big Kofi, another th- another double double, and I think that was number thirty three uh, on you know on during his career at Illinois. I, I see him all. He's going to be at a double double position almost every night. You know, depending on the effort and and long, as long as he stays healthy. But Kofi was a beast. But, you know, another kid, and you mentioned him earlier, was Jacob Granderson. He, you know, Jacob Granderson and DeMonte Williams, to me, are, you know, they're the glue. They're, they're the glue guys, and they're the perfect glue guys. They're everywhere they need to be on defense. They rebound the basketball. They, you know, they take the toughest um, defensive play, I mean, offensive players on the other team, and they do great against them. What do you think about glue guys? I think glue guys, my, my wife used to call them, we would call them when I was coaching. We'd be like, yeah, we need a Johnny. You know, and the reason that we kind of took that nickname, and when I was playing overseas, like three years in a row, we had a dude, well, a couple of guys on the team named John. And it's so funny, the comparison, because they were both little redhead Irish guys. But <laughs> they were both tough as nails and they were our defenders. You know, they were the guys that we would put on people to lock people up and then knock down the occasional three. So then we started calling them Johnnies. And my wife was like, yep, we need, John- we need, we got to get a Johnny on this team. We got, if, you know, because she has to travel with me everywhere when I was recruiting a coach. She was like, we always need a Johnny. Those two guys out of Johnnies of the Illinois team, Demonte Williams and Jacob Granderson, you, you had a chance to, to keep an eye on those guys. They just they just make game winning plays. Yeah. And I mean you need like you can have all the star like star players. Um, but if you don't have like you mentioned like glue guys in order to fill the holes uh that you know if, if you're if you're lacking in just areas teams are gonna attack those. You need those guys that you know that aren't the best but um can fill their role and fill what the team the rest of the team needs to do. And, you know, Grandison and Williams, they, you know, they're filling where uh, this Illinois team lacks. And you, you, you got Kofi, you got Plummer now who's looking like a star, but um, you need the, you need places here and there to stop the, the Purdue's, the Iowa's uh, in order to come away with the conference championship. Uh, and as, as we were talking about the defense, also holding them to only four free throws, Yes. Throughout a game, you're you're not only allowing you're not putting yourself into bad positions where they're getting easy chances defensively and then still limiting their ability to make their shots. Just overall, the team's defense uh, has been playing lights out recently. Um, And when we talk about glue guys, 
Granderson and Williams just showing why you need that defensive versatility on the floor um, in Big Ten play. Yeah, and that's a great point on the free throws. I, I, yeah, excellent point, because one, especially since one of the major issues that Illinois had early, early on in the uh, Brad Underwood tenure was fouls. I mean, we filed a lot. So you can, you as you mentioned, four free throws. I think there were only 10 in the previous game. But now that you see guys that are closing out, defending without putting their hands on people, it is amazing. And moving their feet. So, yeah, they've done a great job defensively. In this game specifically, they did a heck of a job. You know who a guy that kind of flies under the radar, but he is getting – he is, I believe, settled into his role – he is understanding uh, what he needs to do to be able to help this team, and he's working hard at it, is Omar Payne. Now, Lion Night Nation, this is a stat line for your butt, all right? Zero points, zero field goal attempts, zero three-point attempts, zero free throws, zero assists, zero personal fouls in 10 minutes. But what stands out, and you might be shaking your head like, Dion, then how are you talking about this guy? I'm talking about the seven rebounds he had in 10 minutes. 10 minutes, he had seven rebounds. That's hard to do. And not to mention the, which the referee, that was a little upset about it, the beautiful block shot. And then they called it a, a shot clock violation, which I'm like, man, let them keep playing. Don't mess up this young man's stat in that beautiful block shot. By he barely getting any stats. He got to <laughs> give him the block. Yes, it was beautiful. I'm talking about his elbow and head were up around the rim. John, the, the, he flew. And, I'm talking, and that second and then, um, offside helped to get the block shot when, when he drove to the basket. And then they waved it off before because of a shot clock violation. Now, if they had gotten the rebound, okay. You stop it. But we got the rebound. Let that thing keep going, man. I mean, this young man did his thing, working hard. But, no, Omar Payne since coming over from Florida. Um, there's had to be some growth. There's had to be some, some growth in, in him physically, mentally. I mean, he had all the athletic tools. And I think this young man's future is bright, not just at Illinois. I'm talking about across the board. Um, I think he is going to – as he continues to develop to really be a force um, over this next three years, including this one uh, during his time at Illinois. But man, like I said, no points, no rebounds, didn't even look at the basket, seven rebounds. That's almost Dennis Rodman type number. I mean, you, you stretch him out to 30 minutes, that's 21 rebounds. And zero points. Yes, Dennis <laughs> Rodman numbers, baby. Dennis Rodman numbers. We talking about glue guys. Yeah, yeah. Glue guy. Hey, I was I was gonna say like he's just going out there doing cardio, but uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, you, again, that's a lot that, of work too. You ain't kidding. Yeah, <laughs> that is like, a lot of cardio. You, you're not taking you're not taking any shots. Like you're not you're not getting those opportunities. Most people don't want to play if they're not getting the opportunity to score do get those stats up. Like you, you know. Uh, when I played intramural basketball, I at least was asking my dad how many points that I, what, you know, because he would keep track of that. Like, I want to know. So, you know, you're putting, you're putting your body, you're putting yourself, you're putting your mentality on the line there uh, to really help the team win. Um, and, you know, do, going out there and making those winning plays is, you know, what will keep you getting minutes and what will keep this team afloat. No, and you're right. And that it goes back to the, tagline for Illinois they call themselves everyday guys they call themselves blue collar workers and that is an everyday guy stat line because you know what's important to him or to the team I shouldn't say to him to the team and you know keeping his self on the court as he continues to learn man you got to find your you find your niche and and I think the young fella has found his niche because he's doing a heck of a job man but you know we were talking, we touched on the big fella earlier, and I have to go back. You've seen Kofi Coburn shoot free throws. Do you see big fella shooting free throws now? Man, oh. besides Alonzo Plummer, 
Big fella might be the best three point shooter on the team. Jacob Grandison might might roll his eyes at me a little bit for that one, but the big fella, man, is knocking down free throws, which is one of the things they told him in the NBA. You got to become a better free throw shooter. I mean, he has to be approaching seventy percent now, where he shot you know low fifties last year, and he's approaching seventy. If he keeps shooting the ball the way he's doing. Um, under the tutelage of, of assistant coach Jeff Alexander, um, big fella might average close to 30 a game. Uh, I know he didn't get as many touches this game because Rutgers defense, but and plus the guys were knocking down a ton of shots. But have you seen the, the development of Kofi Coburn? Yeah, I mean, you look at all the big guys in the NBA and they're for the, I mean, the guys that get consistent minutes. Um, make their free throws and to develop a free throw shot and be consistent with that. And like to keep working on it because you know how good you are with inside the basket, you know, just being able to dominate the paint ability to shoot your free throws because you're going to get hacked down there down low with how many touches he's going to get per game, how much attention he's going to get um, is huge. You got to, especially uh, when it comes down to clutch time minutes, this game wasn't one of those moments, but, if you know the team's gonna, if the other team is in a foul uh, position, uh, needing to get back into the game, having Kofi out there and being able to trust him a little bit more than years prior with how well he's been able to shoot free throws is still going to play huge um, later down the line. Uh, I, I agree a hundred percent, man. And you need your big fella so you don't ha- you don't fall into that old shack hack a shack. Uh, situation and you you can keep him on the floor like you said it's going to be great for him but man you know another thing you know you always Brad Underwood said something to me at the beginning of the year that stood out and it stood out to me because during his tenure uh he has never this year during his during his tenure he's always had to depend on his freshman class coming in Putting up, uh, putting in points, minutes, whether it was Ayo Desumu and Georgie Bajanisvili, whether it was Kofi Colburn when he came in. This is the first year, as coach said, Dion, I don't have to rely on my freshmen. They can go out and be freshmen and just learn the game and, you know, not have to learn it at an accelerated rate but learn it the way a freshman would. He was like, then I can play them or not play them because of the depth of this team. But this freshman class, man, adds so much depth, so much ability. And I, they, they look like they're a step ahead of where maybe some other uh, freshmen, not just in, at Illinois, but throughout the country um, are right now, especially playing within this system. You know, but I know Brendan Pajinski has not gotten a ton of time right now, but when you watch Pod's growth, his ball handling and things like that, especially being Mr. Basketball in the state of Wisconsin, there's a change of pace. I'm, I'm sure this young man will pick up on that change of pace. He's a great shooter, smart player, athletic. So he's going to get there. But the two freshmen that I am extremely impressed with RJ Melendez and definitely impressed with the way Luke Goody has been playing. You know, you again, you've had an opportunity to watch these freshmen. You've had an opportunity to watch a lot of freshmen. What, what do you think about how these guys are, are going about it? And even, you know, I'm going to let you put Coach on the hot seat a little bit. How do you think Coach has done with the freshmen? Yeah, I mean, I think overall he's done a pretty good job with incorporating them and not – but not letting them, like you mentioned, like, at an accelerated rate, not having it. So uh, they have so much pressure on their backs um, and develop their game through practice, through just the few minutes that they get here and there. Um, but it, they can also be a spark plug um, when, you know, things come around, like, you know, they're, they're basketball players at the end of the day, and they're just trying to get their feet wet in uh, college basketball, but allowing them to, uh you know, get get right into the system without mm-hmm. having to play major minutes is going to play a huge down the line for uh, their growth and their development to know uh, how Coach Underwood wants this team run 
uh, when they're juniors and seniors um, to be able to win, win later on, you know, you got Kofi, you got all these guys who are going to be leaving soon. Um, uh, you just got to work on their game right now uh, and not really focus on um, how well they're playing in games. I don't think that matters as much um, in, until, but what, you got to see the growth throughout practice. Yes, yes. You're looking for progression over a big time, well, over a big time splash. And, and you're right. That's what, that's what we've seen. I mean, it's just a constant progression and growth uh, from these freshmen when, when Luke Goody steps on the court and, and RJ Melendez, they do not look afraid. They do not look shy. They're out there understanding and knowing what it is that they're trying to accomplish during their time on the court. And they're doing that. I mean, Luke Goody right now is shooting above over 40%. And I'm sure RJ Melendez is as well from the three point line, because we know that's something that's big for Illinois but they're also not making mistakes. They're getting the ball where it needs to go. They're playing solid defense. I remember up in Milwaukee, there was one run that RJ Melendez had on the defensive end man, that was impressive. I mean, he got a steal, he got a great defensive deflection and he took a charge all in about two minutes. You know, And that shows the growth and his ability on the defensive end. And then you got the same thing with Luke Goody who was just so smart, so savvy, He's not getting those steals and things like that, but his defense is so solid because he's able to keep guys in front of him and keep them out of the lane that you can see the growth happening for those two players because of all of the repetition, as you mentioned, the repetition in practice, you know, as well as Brendan, Brendan Prudzinski, but the repetition in practice, so they don't have to be the man, you know, they get to play against the Trent Frazier's, the DeMontes, they get, you know, cause they're on that second group. They get to play against those guys every day and, and learn, which is immensely important. But, you know, before we move on, and I think I'd do it right now and maybe do it a couple of times. I know we're supposed to do it once, John, but I'm going to go ahead and knock out a reader sponsor here because we can move on to the next set. But before we move on, let me tell you guys a little bit about our partners over at Bet River Sportsbook. If you haven't signed up with Bet Rivers yet, now's the time because they are offering a $250 match bonus for your first deposit. But what sets them apart is that they, are, that they only require one playthrough to turn your bonus into cash money. With their new Rush Pay instant approval, withdrawing your winnings is safer, more secure, and more reliable. With basketball season here, get into the action by going to betrivers.com today or by downloading the Bet Rivers iOS app. You must be 21 years or older. And if you have a gambling problem, please call 1 800 Gambler. Yesterday, Big Dog, you know, there were some games that took place. And what I'd like to do, we don't have to go through individual games, but let's talk about, you know, kind of the makeup as the Big Ten moves into the Big Ten season, which, you know, we only got a couple of games there before we revert back to a, kind of a non-conference one. But moving into the, the Big Ten conference, you know, our first opponent, Illinois' first opponent, is a team that I personally have some history with. Um, everybody, on, you know, that's in the Lion Eye Nation, unless you're too young, <laughs> you know this. But this, this rivalry has be, been rekindled uh, since the DeMonte uh, McCaffrey incident, since the incident between Coach McCaffrey and Chen, you know, between the, the Luca Garza talking crap and then getting destroyed by Kofi Colburn later on as he continued to grow. Oh, did I say that? I shouldn't say that because I actually like Luca. I like Luca and I like his dad too. Great guys. But at the same time, this was a rivalry that started and had some influence, you know, some things to do with me. But here we are 27, almost 30 years later, and that thing has been rekindled by the, uh, the things I just mentioned earlier. Iowa is on deck uh, coming up here on Monday. A lot of people thought Iowa was going to be down since they lost, you know, what they did. I mean, they lost some great players, um, none greater than, as I mentioned, Luca Garza. 
uh, who's player of the year, Big Ten player of the year, and all of the above, and deservedly so. But this team has come out and has really shown, you know, one, how great a coach Coach McCaffrey is, which I, I, I do have to say he's, he's one of the better coaches uh, in the country. But to watch him come out and to watch this team come out and, and play the way they have uh, so far has been impressive. Yeah, I mean, starting out 7-0 and until they lost to Purdue, like – the team, and, and I mean, they're missing one of the key guys. I'm forgetting his name at the moment, but he was out and still only losing by seven to Jaden Ivey and the rest of the group at Purdue that, you know, we're, we're going to say that Illinois is the best team, but um, Purdue is pretty good too. And yeah. Iowa. <laughs> yeah, they are. Yeah. Um, and uh, Iowa definitely, you know, showing out that, Luca Garza is gone. It doesn't matter. The, the team's still going to be able to compete um, uh, every day. Um, and then when just going into the Illinois game, it's still going to play play huge into, you know, with how well I was been playing recently. Um, and but, but Illinois is getting back on track. So we got to see how um, both teams, you know, after a tough loss from Iowa, how, how they bounce back against Illinois. Well, yeah, it's, it's going to be tough. And, and that player you mentioned um, that was out is Keegan Murray. Um, I, I, he's a sophomore now. I was super excited by Keegan Murray last year. Uh, I mean, Keegan has moved himself into being probably, no, there's no probably to it, a, one of the top NBA prospects coming out of the Big Ten. I mean, he, he didn't play that last game. You, you're taking 24, almost 25 points, nine rebounds out of your starting lineup or off your team. So if Keegan's playing, they have a very good chance of winning that game, seeing they only lost it by seven uh, to what will be this week the number one team in the nation. You know, Matt Painter is my guy. I love Matt and had staff over there. But this Iowa team may may have come out of that win, come out of there with a win in Iowa City if Keegan Murray was on the court because that young man is whoo. And then of course Patrick McCaffrey is has you know son of the coach. You know not, he ain't getting minutes, uh, ladies and, ladies and gentlemen, because he's the son of the coach. That kid can hoop, and you know he's second on the league on the team in scoring right now. And then you have Chris Murray, who's the brother of Keegan Murray who stepped up and played really well in that Purdue game. He's averaging close to 12 points a game. And then a, a name that every Illinois fan loves to hate is Jordan Bohannon, um, who has come back, you know, from the, from the crypt. Again, like, like the crypt keeper, man. It seems like this dude has been in school 10 years. It's like, does he ever want to leave? <laughs> but, you know, this Iowa game is going to be a tough game. It's going to be a tough challenge. I mean, you know, Coach Underwood mentioned on the radio, you know, post game of after Rutgers that man, I haven't won in, in Iowa. Now, granted, he's only played two games there uh, during his tenure, but I had to shake my head because I just didn't. It just seemed strange that we have not won in Iowa. But how do you see? And then we can talk about it. Of course, I don't know. That's going to be a really good game. Your thoughts? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, we, Purdue, Iowa, Illinois. Michigan, uh, Michigan State, even like yeah. all those teams, like they're, they're all going to be tough games. And with Iowa even playing, like as we mentioned without Murray, playing that well um, and against Purdue that had all these, has still all these expectations to win a national championship. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be, it's going to be a, you know, a pretty, pretty big game for Illinois to, you know, still show uh, like that, you know, finishing number two last year um, in the final AP poll that they're still up there with those teams and that Iowa, you know, losing Luka Garza, like we mentioned, they're still going to be right there. So it's definitely going to be a tight one um, coming up. All right, it's going to be a good one. I mean, it's one thing about Coach McCaffrey, Coach Teams is that, you know, Iowa can all, they can score. Man, I mean, they're averaging about 90, 91 points a game. Now, granted, 
the only two real team, and I shouldn't say real teams, high level teams that they've played has been Virginia, <clears throat> has been Virginia and Purdue. <clears throat> excuse me, has been for Virginia and Purdue. But this is historically, you know, even going back to before Coach McCaffrey came to Iowa, that's always been his thing is putting the ball in the basket. So what Illinois is going to have to do is, is really lock down on the defensive end. I mean, Illinois is a team that can put the ball in the basket as well, but they're going to have to lock down and know where these scores and these shooters are from Iowa because they got guys that can really knock it down. I'm not sure what's going to be going on with Murray, but he's one of their top three-point shooters. His brother is a great three-point shooter. You know, we all know Jordan Bohannon can step across half court and knock down a shot. And then, you know, George, Joe, Joe Troussant, who was, you know, a little erratic as a freshman point guard for them, has gotten couldn't shoot. He was all head down to the basket. He's even improved his jump shot. So they got some guys that's going to be able to put some points on the board, and Illinois is going to have to lock down on the defensive end. But Illinois can put some points on the board as well. But at my point, the key is going to be rebounded off the glass, killing them on the glass, let me say that, and then shutting them down, especially at the three-point line. As you look at this game, uh, John, what you know, what stands out to you? Well, at first, I think Kofi has got to dominate inside against uh, Iowa. Like, really, again, uh, preseason All-American, you know, so many expectations for him. He's got to He's got to be their main guy in order to uh, come away with the win because, you know, they can kind of compete athleticism wise around the perimeter, but uh, no one's stopping Kofi off that in, on Iowa's team. And he's got to show that no one could stop him. So I really expect a big game from him um, against Iowa. But, you know, Iowa, like we mentioned, they can shoot, they can shoot it. And uh, we talked about the guys who, are stepping up defensively, they got to do it again. And they're going to have to keep doing it again throughout the rest of the season. Um, but, you know, it, it's going to be a testament to how well we mentioned their defense, how well they can keep up defensively. And, like, we don't really know how good Rutgers is uh, going to be this season. Um, you know, they've been pretty good recently. Um, but, um, you know, shutting them down only 51 maybe they aren't the best team if you can show that defense against Iowa um it's you know they, they're going to be a good Illinois is going to be there throughout the big uh big 10 this year after a little bit of hitch um in the beginning of the year no no doubt and you know my my coaches always say and every coach has always said this offense wins games defense wins championships and, and that's one of the things that they're definitely going to have to show because there are some great teams, as you mentioned, and you ran down a few uh, in, in the Big Ten Conference. And you're right. The Rutgers might be a little down, um, but when you play against a team that's down, you're supposed to do you do what you do, what Illinois did. You go and beat them, beat the bricks out of them. That's, you know, and that's what you do. But you, you mentioned some really, really um, historically – good teams that are going to be right there. You know, we can start with Purdue. Uh, Matt Painter has done a, a tremendous job. For those that don't know or remember, I actually played against Matt uh, when we were at Illinois. Uh, he, he was a big point guard for them. And, you know, he you can see where he's brought that mentality of, of being a point and knowing how to do some things to the court and has really helped develop a, a lot of those guards that are playing – not to mention the probably one of the highest prospects on the NBA boards, at least according to a few of my friends that are um, scouts in the NBA. You know, Ivy is is a heck of a player. Yeah, Ivy, Ivy is going to be one of those like main guys. Not maybe you know it's a discussion about who's top. I don't think he's around. The top, he could work his way up there. Uh, but like Paolo, Chet, and Jabari Smith from Auburn, probably those top three that could be number one. But Ivy's going to be a lottery pick, and Ivy's going to be one of those guys. And he's shown why, um, you know, running running the system there at Purdue 
with Edie and Williams and Williams even coming off the bench and he's been a dominant force um, throughout his time and coming off the bench is showing still that that's a, you know, having a, having a killer off the bench like that um, is going to play dividends. And with, with, with talking about Ivy, I mean, against Iowa coming away with 19 off seven to 13 shooting uh, and playing just all around basketball, he, he's one of those guys that you're going to have to look out for this season, um, especially once the new week comes around and they're going to be number one um, uh, for the poll. Oh, no, no doubt. I mean, I love that young man's game. You know, when he stepped in as a freshman, of course, made the all freshman team. That young man cannot, I mean, he's not just a slasher. You look at his body and you look at his athleticism and you think he'd only, you know, be somebody that's a slasher. This, this kid can shoot the ball puts it on the floor, gets to the basket. He's excellent in transition, you know, but one of the things that goes underestimated by him is his defense. I mean, so he is, he is key for them. And I agree, he's going to be a lottery pick. And I think more so his upside is what has people so excited because he's, he's just playing on pure talent right now. And, and the more he learns, the better he continues to bring up those skills. He's going to be lights out. But the big fella in the middle, and you mentioned him, Zach Eady, man, has been – you watched his growth from freshman year to sophomore year. I don't know where Matt and these guys – they keep pulling these guys <laughs> off of trees, man. You go out – every year, every two years, they got somebody that's 7'4", uh, a 7'4 project, and then he ends up being one of the top players in the Big Ten. But the duo with, with Zach and Travion Williams, man, it, it, it is, is a spectacular. And that's going to be a – that's – Looking at what they did last year against Kofi and against Illinois, that's going to be Edie's real test. Um, and I know he's big, but man, you know, it, it'll be interesting. I'm not going to get too far ahead of myself on that game, but it's going to be super excited about it and, and watching those guys play. Michigan State is going to be lights out as always, you know, in my opinion. I love Tom Izzo. If he's not the best coach in the country, he's definitely there in that top five. He just continues to do it over and over and over again. You know, and, and normally he just doesn't, his consistency is is what, you know, sets him apart for me. But again, I shouldn't say the best coach because you've got Matt Painter, you've got Brad Underwood, you got Ju Juwan Howard, you got a lot of guys that are really doing it. But, you know, that Michigan team is really young. You know, how do you what do you see from them going forward? Yeah, I mean, they're they're they kind of had that slow. We're talking about Michigan. They kind of had that slow start um, that we were talking about with Illinois coming off mm -hmm. such a huge, you know, Juwan Howard's. But he's going to get that team right. And, you know, I do think that they're still going to be up there uh, as we're talking about all these other teams. But I don't really know if they're going to be as good as last year's. Uh, but, I mean, they, they lost a few guys. Um, yes. But you know, they were really good last year. And I just don't know if they're going to be able to keep those, keep that up this year. But, you know, we'll see um, throughout the later stretch of the Big Ten. Yeah, I think they're kind of suffering from a little bit of what Illinois is suffering from. You know, you lose your leader. You, you lose that guy that keeps everyone calm and under control on the court and you know it was Io DeSumo for us everybody as you know and I think that's one of those hiccups that that Michigan is going through right now is really finding who that floor general leader locker room guy is, is going to be for them but they are extremely talented um, and, you know they're just so young but so I agree with you you never know what you're going to get going down the road because of that youth you know, they still got big Hunter Dickerson up there, man. And, and Eli Brooks, the, the super seniors playing extremely well for them as well. But, you know, I don't know. We'll see where they're going to be simply because of that youth. And if it grows mentally uh, as well as physically as quickly as they need it to. But if you had to pick, uh, I guess, a, a sleeper team. And I know I'm throwing you on. I know I'm throwing you. I'm throwing you way out there right now, but I also know you cover you cover sports, so I'm sure you have a, you know, you have, may have a, an idea 
who, who would that sleeper team be for you in the Big Ten? So, and if you give them, I'll give you a little rundown just to, to sweeten and help out a little bit. Purdue right now, eight and zero. Indiana right now, seven and one. Uh, second in the Big Ten. Of course, Illinois is at six and two. Minnesota is at six and zero. Wisconsin, seven and one. Michigan State, seven and two. Northwestern, five and two. Ohio State, five and two. Of course, the big changes over at Maryland, which you know I know that's your your neck of the woods. If you want to talk a little bit about that, we can. Since the departure of uh, Coach Turgeon, five and three. Michigan, five and three. Um, Penn State, four and three. Iowa, seven and one. Nebraska, five and four. Rutgers, four and four. So, which one of those teams? You know, if you were looking at it. And, I, you know, the Purdue's are going to be there. The Illinois, we're expecting to be there. The Michigan States, we're expecting to be there. The Ohio States, we're expecting to be there. And even the Wisconsin. But I just want to know, who, who do you? I, I had my answer, like, even before you r- ran I that. I was running my mouth too much. <laughs> I, I was, I mean, like, 7-1 star for Indiana. Like, that, Tracy Jackson Davis. I know you, you weren't so high on him preseason uh, when we were talking. But he, he he's been – He's been killing the game, and I mean, they just beat Nebraska two by thirteen. Um, that you, you know, they they weren't so hot last year, but Indiana always. Mike Woodson coming in and coaching this team is going to pay dividend. Like he, this team is they they can compete in the Big Ten, and it's showing off. And I think I think they can compete with some of the teams that we we were talking about. Maybe mm-hmm. I don't think they're going to win it. I think, you know, I do think Purdue's probably going to win the Big Ten, but I, 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 I <laughs> hey, you're, say, on, I you're on champagne. <laughs> hey, all, all right, all right. Buddy. Illinois is going to win the Big Ten, but no, I, I do I think your honesty, big dog. <laughs> yeah, um, but uh, I do think Indiana is going to compete with the those teams. Uh, Tracy Jackson Davis is a top talent, um, and just overall the team around him. Yeah, uh, is one of the better teams um, to me in the Big Ten. I, and I do not disagree with that. Um, Mike Woodson is a great coach and, and he's a heck of a coach in the NBA during his tenure. Of course, he is holding that Indiana pride, having played at Indiana under Bobby Knight. Um, so, of course, he's going to be I, I do not disagree with that um, answer. But the my team I'm going to pick and. And they're always, they always seem to be there. They always seem to give other teams the flux. Even when you look at them name for name in comparison on the rosters of other teams, they're never the most uh, exciting. They're never the most athletic. They're never the best shooters. I mean, it's crazy. But Wisconsin, man, they just play a brand of basketball that I think really just wears other teams down and they just get bored of playing them. So, <laughs> so they end up, you know, winning some games. We're going to have to keep an eye on Wisconsin. Wisconsin and Indiana, I would agree 100%. Um, are, I think Wisconsin's are, like a sleeper team like every year. So, <laughs> like, um, they're, they're definitely going to be always just, you know, annoying here. They're gonna beat. They're gonna beat Illinois one game, and it's gonna be one of those. You, you know, Illinois is gonna be like, watch. watch. Illinois is gonna be like eighth in the country, and then Wisconsin is just gonna win randomly. Uh, they they always do things like that. So, no, and you're right. But why can't they beat Purdue? Why, why you gotta throw Illinois in there, man? Hey, all right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, John. No, I'm just kidding. Man. But no, I understand exactly what you're saying. I mean. They always seem to hang around and they always seem to play real big at big moments. And, you know, that, that takes, that, that goes, you know, you take your hat off to the coaching staff up there. You take your hat off to the players. They have played Wisconsin basketball for as long as I can remember. And it's been effective for them. So, you know, if you don't control, and this is what, every time we play uh, Wisconsin, you know, the keys to the game is always going to be controlling tempo. Uh, against Wisconsin if you allow them to sit back and and play the way they play man like I said they want to shoot at the end of the shot clock in the day in this era where everybody is trying to up the the number of attempts they want to take down the number of attempts because they understand it gives them a, a, an opportunity to win the way they play so yeah you're right man they 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 can be a sleeper they're a sleeper every year even when they're at the top of the Big Ten they're the sleeper <laughs> 
<laughs> which is crazy to say. But yeah, man. So we're gonna move on from this Big Ten stuff, man. We this 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 year I did something special, and I I thought it not just I John and I thought it would be a great opportunity to allow Align Eye Nation to allow our listeners to ask some questions, uh, and 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 in the the run up to this when I posted it on Twitter, and we'll do this again because we didn't get as many questions as I would have asked, as I would have liked, but we're gonna go through some of these questions. I promise you, Align Eye Nation, you know you're gonna get the truth and only the truth and nothing but the truth. So help me God on these questions. So let's go big dog, let's All run. Right. We talked about him earlier, but uh, Steve from Richmond, Kentucky, he asked, have we ever had a transfer in the past that has been as impactful as Plummer early on? Oh, you know what? I don't even need to think about that one. I'm going to say no. Um, I, I don't think there has been a, a transfer that, oh, you know what? I take that back. There has been one. Um, and his they, we call him Flight 33. He was the uh, motivation, the energy, the heart of what I consider the best Illini basketball team ever, and that's Kenny Battle. When Kenny transferred from Northern Illinois to Illinois, it put Illinois on a different level. Um, no, Kenny was not the scorer that Alfonso Plummer has shown to be, not the shooter that Plummer has shown himself to be, but Kenny brought an energy. Kenny brought a a level of toughness and just drive that, you know, and let's just be quite honest, that team was the best team in the country, you know, but this is why you play games. And this is why you play the NCAA tournament games. The best team in the country didn't win the championship in 1989. And nope, I am not afraid to say it. And if there's any of my so-called experts that want to d debate that, please, Champagne on ice, just let me know. Or give me a call, because a lot of you got my phone number anyway. But that flying Illini team was amazing. And it was amazing in large part to Kenny Battle, who was a transfer again, like I said, from Northern uh, Illinois. But he would have to be the only one that I could think of, because Alfonso Plummer, man, whoo, boy. We, we call him the microwave on the, radio, on the radio after Vinny Johnson, because, man, he's heating it up and heating it up fast. Yeah, definitely. Um, so now Curtis from Fulton, Illinois. Uh, we talked about Kofi earlier as well. Is Kofi the best center in Illinois history? He wanted to ask, add that you were really a four that had to play the five and you did it great. So Curtis is a smart man. I love him. I love you, Curtis. <laughs> but no, he, yes, Kofi is the best center. Uh, to play at the University of Illinois. And he's the most dominant center that I can re ever remember us having. Now, of course, there may have been some back in the day that dominated their era, but Kofi Colburn, you put him in any era of Illinois basketball and he would be dominating. Even back in my day when I think the Big Ten was really at its heyday, especially because of the difference in the rules and the physicality and things that were going on then. Uh, yeah, he, he is definitely the best center uh, to have played at the University of Illinois right now. And his continued development uh, has been just outstanding. And it just, I just want, I wish the big fella, he's one of the best people, best kids that I know. I just want, I wish the best for him. But you're right, Kurt. I was a power forward that was forced to play center a couple of years up in there. Um, first freshman year, I had Andy Petty. Senior year, I had Shelly Clark. So I really didn't have to play center those those years. But the other ones I did. But great question. I hope you uh, like that answer. Next. So we got Brent from t uh, uh, Taylorville. I, I don't think we should. Uh, I don't think we should ask that on Champagne on Ice. But. Uh -oh. Uh oh, Brent, you you threw a question. You you must have threw a question out there that had nothing to do with basketball. Well, Taylorville, man, I I I I have a lot of. I still have friends 
in, in Taylorville. And you read that question to me earlier. Uh, first of all, Brent, let me say this, man. I don't kiss and tell, never have, never will. But you got Doyle and Shannon down there in Taylorville, who are great friends of mine through, uh, through Illinois. And I stood in, in their wedding. And uh, you want to know some of that history stuff, man. You got to go ask them. I don't kiss and tell. <laughs> there, there's your answer, Brent. Um, exactly. <laughs> um, so then Ke Carol from Edwardsville asked, when everyone is back and healthy, do you see coach shortening the bench to around eight players or not? First of all, that's, that's my girl. Carol, love you. Big hugs. That is my girl, man. Carol is a, a sweetheart, um, very high basketball knowledge, often shoots me a text during the game, but so you can keep them coming. Uh, do I see coach shortening the bench? Whew. I mean, how do you, it, it, how do you shorten this bench, especially when your freshmen are, are coming in and they're playing as, as well as they are? I think there will be varying substitutions um, at times, depending on injury, depending on um, how someone is playing, depending on the feel of the game that coach may see a, a different matchup that is, is better suited. But I, I think all year we'll play close to 10 players. Uh, so I don't see them shortening it to eight, uh, at least not right now, especially with you know, RJ Melendez, as well as um, Luke Goody playing as well as they are and as well as they have been, it, it's going to be hard to really shorten that to eight. But I'll tell you this, Carol, and, and the Line I Nation, that is one of the best problems if you're a coach you want to have is to not be able to shorten your bench because that means everybody's playing and they're playing productively. Um, so... We'll go with uh, we'll go with Gabe from Peoria, or I don't Peoria, Peoria. Illinois, uh, Peoria, from Pete uh, Town. Um, do you see Plummer remaining in the starting lineup? Another Plummer question as the season progresses, or is he better suited as being an instant offense guy off the bench? Man. With the rhythm he's playing with right now, all I have to say is this. I'm so glad I don't have to make that decision um, because what he has brought from an offensive presence really opens up things for Kofi. It, it's, you know, allows Kofi to be able to play. So do I see him remaining in the lineup? Yes, I do, actually. Uh, I think you or, or Brad and, the, and this staff who are, have high basketball IQs will figure out a way to play a three guard uh, offense. And with him clicking the way he is, I just don't know how you you take him out of that lineup, how you put him you know, down, not just because of the points that he is putting up, but because of the threat that he is. And so you basically clear a side for Kofi when you have him on that side. So I, I don't know how you make that change. I mean, thank God I'm doing what I'm doing now, which is talking to you on the radio or working with, uh, <laughs> working with Brian on the sideline and I don't have to make that decision. I uh, gave out another question. Uh, so do you see this initial stretch where the team has been bombarded by injuries detrimental or good for the long term for the team? Uh, and do, he adds, will it affect long-term chemistry for the team? Well, first of all, I think that's a great question. I think it's a great question. And I believe teams and individuals are built through adversity. And with that in mind, you can't go through as much adversity as this Illinois team has gone through and have them not be better as they continue to get together, work together. I mean, and I think that's a lot of the reason Brad Underwood teams kind of struggle in the beginning and then they get better later because they continue to become so um, connected, you know, because of the culture that he set up. So I, I think we get better as we move forward. Um, so then we'll go with uh, 
from Curtis Dietz at Curtis Dietz. He didn't say where he's from. Uh, so he didn't follow the directions, but Thank you, you're being hard here, Curtis. <laughs> um, there has been many guys that improved in their years at Illinois. What are a few guys that were so good in their first couple of years that they are underappreciated? Bruce Douglas comes to mind. He was great as a freshman. Most people don't give him the credit. Well, Bruce Douglas, and, and, and first of all, I agree with that 100%. Um, Bruce Douglas is still the all-time leader in assists and steals in Illinois history. So he may not get, and, and I think a lot of it is, is and, the, and the teams won when he was there. You know, he was coming in on the heels of Derek Harper, you know, and, and really took the team and elevated it. Uh, he was the point guard when I really started watching Illinois basketball, um, when it would be on in Chicago. We only had one channel, so they were, they would alternate between DePaul and Illinois basketball games. Um, but he's right. He does. He, I don't think he gets the respect and the love that he should. My point guard for a lot of that time, Kiwan Garris, you know, who's the second leading scorer in the history of the University of Illinois. I don't believe Kiwan gets the love and the respect that he should either. I mean, Kiwan was a great player. I mean, he came in and he broke my freshman scoring record that I had set, of course, four years ago earlier. He came in and he broke it his freshman year because he's such a great player, great scorer, and became a great leader um, on, you know, from 95 on through the different coaches even. you know, And, and his game did nothing but grow. Uh, I think another player that did not get uh, a lot of the respect and love that he should have um, was the backup point guard on that Flying Illini team, Larry Smith. Uh, Larry kind of took me under his wings my freshman year. Uh, he was a senior that year. Larry was one of the best players I've seen play, period. And I think anyone on that flying Illini team, which I consider the greatest Illinois team ever, will tell you. Larry Smith, boo, is whew, a beast. So there's just a couple. Uh, and I think another, and this is going back even a little bit further than me, is Mark Smith. Uh, any, anybody that has had an opportunity to watch Mark Smith play, I did not get a chance to watch Mark Smith play. But when I talk to great players, you know, Eddie Johnson, Eddie Johnson sings the praises of Mark Smith all the time. Eddie Johnson was all time leading scorer before I broke his record. So when you have great players saying that the other player was the best player on the floor, <laughs> then you believe that. And I, I would say probably, you know, Mark Smith probably. He gets love, but he doesn't get the love that maybe he rightfully deserves. But those are just a few names. And, and that's a great question, by the way. Yeah, definitely. Um, he had another question, too. So maybe you got to live up to the hype. Uh, okay. Who is the toughest big you had to go up against? Alan Henderson or AC Earl would be my guess. What he oh, said. My, oh, my God. No. <laughs> I mean, AC Earl was big. I mean, but. AC was a good player, played at Iowa, um, was a tough out, but, you know, no, I wouldn't give him. Allen Henderson for Indiana, really, really, really good player. Um, and, and, yes, very tough to go up against. You know, I really didn't defend Glenn Robinson as much because coach didn't want me picking up files, but the big dog was an absolute beast um, on, on the offensive end of the court. But, the best player I played against is now coaching his alma mater. Um, and that was Juwan Howard. Um, and, and a lot of that was because our games are so similar. And, you know, it, but the, he, he had a little bit more freedom to do some things, uh, you know, when he was at Michigan than I had at Illinois. But our games are so similar that they're so fundamentally sound to go along with a high basketball IQ um made it really difficult I mean a lot of people probably thought I would say Chris Weber but at that time Chris was just super athletic and, and had a high motor so I could combat that you try to combat that along with the mental part as along with the skill part and that makes your job real hard um Juwan Howard is, is definitely the the toughest player that that I played against in the Big Ten um and so we'll wrap it up we were talking about uh, the Big Ten teams earlier, um, and Curtis from Fulton, Illinois, he wanted to ask, or 
Um, no, that's not the question I wanted to go with. It was um, Charlie in San Diego, by the way, of Glenview, Illinois. He wants to know your level of disdain for our conference brethren and who is after Iowa. So he already knows. Uh, <laughs> that's a good question. Great question. Um, my level of disdain for our conference brethren. First of all, let's cut out the East Coast guys because they weren't in the conference with the exception of Penn State, um, which came in my senior year. So let's cut out the whole East Coast guys. Um, Iowa, for sure. And, and, you know, again, Illini Nation, we all know why. Um, so I know there's no need to rehash that. But also because we just played uh, some <laughs> really just knock them, knock them down, drag them out games. Against, oh, you know what? Let's go back to one question before. You, you mentioned toughest players to play. And I have to put this guy in there. And I have to put him in there, not because he scored a lot of points against me or, or anything like that. Chris Street, who played at Iowa, I hated fuck. Oh, no, this is my podcast. I hated <laughs> fucking playing against Chris Street um, at Iowa. And it was really because he just played. This was one of those guys that just did not stop playing. Every second he was on the court, he's hitting you. He's da, 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 da. Chris Street. Chris, unfortunately, you know, passed away way too early in a car accident, but nothing but respect for that guy, man, and, and his family. But Chris Street has to rate right up there with Juwan. I mean, as far as dudes that I just did not like to play against. And, and that is a tip of the the tip of the cap to, to the player and person that he he was. But Let's get back to this. Iowa, of course, is number one in there. Um, and I'm going to be flat out honest on this. I didn't like anyone. I, 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 there was not one team. No, because for me, and this is, the difference, <laughs> this is the difference between, I'll, I'll say me, I won't speak for my era, but for me, anyone, it didn't matter who it was. Ask my teammates about how I was in practice. When we stepped into that rectangle, you were no longer my friend. I, I didn't like you. I was coming at your head for every single second that we were on the court. It was about the competition. It was about, for me, it was war. It was going to war every time when I stepped on the court. You know, this is why Dick Vitale, you know, gave me the nickname, the silent assassin. Man, I wasn't out there to talk to you. I wasn't out there to be your friend. I was out there to kick your ass. And, and that's what I wanted to do day in, day out. So yeah, the Iowa thing was personal um, because of what Bruce Pearl tried to screw me and Coach Collins and the university. So that, that ran deep for a very, very long time. But as far as another team that I disdain, I love Juwan. I didn't like Juwan when I was playing against him. I wanted to kill him. The same as I wanted to kill Chris and 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 uh, Sean Respert and um, Mike Popowski and you go over to Indiana, you got Henderson and everybody else. It didn't matter who they were. If your uniform was a different color than mine, when that horn went off, it was your ass. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I think that's uh, how we're going there, to, there's no real other questions. So that's <laughs> how we're going to wrap it up there. <laughs> That is, that is a good close out. Well, John, man, yeah, I'll tell you this. You know what? This is the first time we did this. We got to do this again. This was fun. It was fun. It was fun. Yeah. This was fun. And then, you know, you, you got a face for TV. Don't let nobody tell you you have a face for radio. We need to get on out here, man, and, and keep doing this because this was a ton of fun. So I, I, I appreciate you. You know, we normally give the last minute to the guests. So, John, you want to take the last minute or you want me to take it? Uh, we could, what if we did like 30-30? Go ahead. Get your 30 in and then I get 30 in. I like that 30-30 thought. Um, yeah, no, I definitely, I, you know, I'm the producer of the show, so I definitely love, like, you you talk bringing on guys, uh, former players and, and uh, members of the media. Um, and just overall, like, watching Illinois play, um, has been real fun over the I mean I'm a Maryland guy so coming kind of coming in a little bit later for the Big Ten but still watching Illinois play 
gives me a little bit of nightmares um but uh uh recently but definitely just love producing the show um and looking forward to more all right well first thing i'm gonna do is give you a shout out for wearing that chicago bulls shirt good man (laughs) Good man. Now we got to get you some Illinois, some champagne on ice gear. So when you come on, then you can support that. But yeah. love the love. So appreciate it, brother. But to Illini Nation, I love you guys, man. I love you guys. And, and, and I think you know and understand I bleed orange. If you look at my wall, that's not, you got the picture. Oh, this side. You got the picture of me up here, but there's a heck of a lot more on this wall other than just photos of myself. And it's all history and it's all my life and things at the University of Illinois. Anyone that has heard me speak, you know, know and and understand where I'm coming from when I say the University of Illinois didn't just change Deion Thomas's life, but it changed the life for my family, entire family, Uh, my brothers, my cousins, all of those guys have gone on, a lot of those uh, people have gone on to college and things like that because I was the one, the first one, to do it. And I was able to bring them down and walk them across that campus. But what Illinois basketball did for me, you know, Jimmy Collins, Dick Nagy, uh, Mark Coombs, and of course, Lou Henson was made me a great basketball player and allowed me to shine. It gave me an opportunity to play in the NBA, which I chose to go and play across the water. But that 14 years was (laughs) some of the best 14 years of my life. Uh, opened my eyes to the experiences and all of those things that uh, I was able to go through and deal with and have fun and all of the people and the food and just all of the travel I did over there does not happen if it's not for the University of Illinois. And I'm going to go one step further. Does not happen for the people that support our donors and the people that give to the University of Illinois because they fund our scholarships. But last but not least, the Illini Nation, It does not happen if it's not for you. You are the Duracell battery that keeps these teams rolling because you go out there and you support every single game, no matter what the sport is. I love you guys. I think I may have ran over my 30, big fella, but, you know, it is my pod. It is is my podcast. You make the rules. You make the rules. (laughs) You know, I guess I could kind of go over a little bit. But, no, Illini Nation, love you. You know, we're going to, um, I know John's a, a Maryland guy, but we're going to convert him. We'll, we'll get him over. Hey, Make my, him- my cousin just graduated from Illinois. So we'll, that's, why I gave you, that's why I gave you a little heat earlier. I'm like, you know, I know you're on the, you're on the East Coast, but you got, you got, you got a lion eye blood in you, man. So you, we're going to make him an honorary fighting <laughs> lion eye. There you go. We're going to get you some gear out there. Um, but a lion eye nation, love you. Truly appreciate you get, uh, joining us again on Champagne on Ice. Uh, as always, check out the Field of 68. Find them, like them, subscribe. Great content covering college basketball. If you have not already, like and subscribe to this podcast, Champagne on Ice. You can find us on Spotify as well as Apple Music. I mean, Apple Podcasts. Find us, subscribe, and like. And also, Tell your family members, especially the ones that are Illini fans, and even if they're not, get their butt on this podcast. And last but not least, thanks again to the sponsors over at Bet River Sportsbook. Hey, man, if we're not partnering up with you, I don't know if this thing is rolling the way it is. But appreciate you. Appreciate you all. Thank you, John. We got to do this again, man. I'm I'm liking this. Uh, I'm liking this. So we got to do this again, brother. <laughs> Definitely, for sure. All right. All right. Love, peace, and hair grease, champagne. The Lion Eye Nation. Take the mic.